Well, howdy guys and gals. Welcome back to The Social Regressive and part 12 in our optics series. Today we're gonna to be talking about the real bottom line, price. This is where we start getting back to that original wrong question that I mentioned in the first video. Someone will roll up into a forum or on Facebook and they'll ask a group of people that actually know a whole lot of stuff, all right, what is the best scope for say 308? They're gonna mention maybe their rifle. I have a, a Remington 783 in 308. And then they're inevitably going to get the wrong answer because not because the people at that forum don't know what they're talking about. They actually, in many cases, know lots, but they got the wrong question. So they're gonna come back with the wrong answer. And a lot of the time what I see is someone coming back with an answer based on price. They just assume if, they throw some money at it, then, and it's something that they particularly own or something that they really wish they could own, then they will have fixed that other person's problems. But that's not what we should be thinking about. Remember, we have to go back to purpose. This is all about the target and what we're trying to hit. How, uh, what size is it? How far away is it? How mobile is it? How dangerous? How many of them are there? And then we have to take into account some of those other factors. Like we do need to think about what cartridge we're shooting and what its ballistics are. We need to think about what rifle we're using. We need to think about the terrain and what sort of things we're gonna be dealing with. And once you start to add all that stuff up, then you can really start to figure out which scope that you're after. And I will say uh, right up front that we have scopes here on the bench that are at a, a complete variety of price tags. We have some actually here that are under 100 bucks, like this Simmons 4X, that Pro Target Rimfire. And we have some that get uh, pretty well up past $1,000, like this guy right here, that uh, US Optics TS20X. Each one has its place, and some of these that fit that more budget uh, side of things, you might be really surprised at how well they function for you. We're gonna talk about how you might wanna pick the scope that's right for you and what you're doing and to actually meet the budget that you're on. I have some notes here on my phone to help me keep on track so I don't miss anything. There actually are some real benefits that can come from price. Now remember that this doesn't always add up. Sometimes if you pay more, you're not necessarily getting more than something that could actually be about half its price. Uh, that's where you start to get into some of the actual practical tests that independent reviewers like myself, like Joe Ray, Kurt Vaughn, West Desert Shooter, The Hyde, some of these other guys that are actually going out there and testing these scopes and don't have a dog in the hunt. They're not being paid by anybody to test this stuff. That's where you can start to figure out where some of these start to trade different things. Okay, now the first thing that you really might start getting into as you increase the price is your glass quality. For the most part, this one is going to be true. As you start getting into more expensive scopes, you might be getting into larger lenses, for example, and ones that are made of a better material. If you see some of these that are listed as having, uh, say on the Bushnell side, ED prime glass, that's your extra load uh, dispersion glass, or you have uh, HD glass, high density glass, that glass is going to have less porosity to it, and it's going to uh, perhaps be a bit more uniform in its construction. It's going to have uh, maybe a higher grade of silica, and you might be getting into something that uh, really can resolve details a lot better than some of the others. Now, the size of the lens doesn't necessarily indicate its resolution capability. Uh, for example, the Bushnell Forge that we have right here with its 50 millimeter objective, in my opinion, to my eye, can actually resolve uh, details better than the 50 millimeter objective that we have here on the Nikon FX1000. Both of them are very high. I'm not going to knock one or the other. It's not like uh, either of them can't get the job done. But to my eye, this one does uh, not only reproduce its resolution a little better, but actually I think its color reproduction reprodu is a little better as well. Uh, the Nikon FX1000 is still awesome, but I think this one edges it out just a little bit. And as you start getting up into the elite tactical end of things with Bushnell, that's when you really start getting into some glass that can work wonders, like the, uh, the Bushnell XRS2. Holy cow, that can see details at crazy, not just crazy distances, 
and in uh, kind of weird circumstances. But actually, as you start to dial your turrets to the extreme, that glass is so good that you can still see all the detail. And that is not something that I can say about all of the scopes on here. Uh, some of these, like the SWFA, is quite nice, that fixed power. But as you dial it to its, ex its extreme range, you do start to lose some of that resolution because of an astigmatism. The glass is slightly astigmatic, and it starts to kind of smear the image just a little bit. It's not bad. This is still a great extreme range scope. I like it very much, but uh, it does start to fall apart just a tad as you get toward the edge. And I mean, heck, the, this is a $300 scope. The Bushnell uh, Elite Tactical XRS2, that one costs over $2,000. If you can get it on sale, it might be about $1,800. Big difference between those two, both in terms of the glass quality and the price tag, but a lot of you guys might get plenty of use out of this $300 guy right here. Another thing that you might get as you start to increase your price tag, you might start to get some different correction elements on the inside. Uh, we don't just have our curved glass in there, we actually have some kind of hidden elements on the inside that can help to fix some of the problems that have been created, especially by that objective lens. Uh, sometimes we can have some that can help to kind of fix your chromatic aberration. Some of them are going to fix your barrel distortion, which is going to be a curvature of objects, especially at close range as you look through the scope. Some of those are going to uh, kind of change your pin cushion and your barrel and try to make things line up. So when you look at a telephone pole, especially at the edge of your image, it's still going to be straight and not curved. That's where some of the higher end scopes are going to go, like uh, especially if you get into the US Optics B series. Uh, I've looked through just one of those so far. It's one of their LPVO, the low power variable optic scopes that you put on ARs. Uh, that thing was just magic. At close range, it didn't seem to distort objects at all. There seemed to be no barrel distortion, and that just blew my mind. I've, I've never seen a scope quite like that. That might not be a big deal for you. Uh, it's, it's a cool thing to have, but uh, yeah, if you are somebody that really wants to be extremely precise with everything that you do, maybe it's worth that extra uh, price tag there. We also get into coatings. As we get into some of these uh, lower end scopes, some of the less expensive ones like the Simmons Gold Metal right here, uh, we have the Bushnell AR Optics. These are still good and they're going to have fully multi-coated lenses that's going to help reduce your internal reflections so you don't get weird little uh, light leaks and uh, blurs and blooms on the inside of this and it's going to be able to deal with your off-axis lights a lot better but then some of these are going to step up those coatings and make them even better the Bushnell Forge I keep coming back to or the Bushnell Engage the Elite Tactical line I think everything from the Engage up is going to have something that's called the Exo Barrier on it and that coating is mind-blowingly good uh, it doesn't really allow anything to stick to the lenses at all. It, it's waterproof, it's fogproof, uh, very fogproof. And even if you get stuff like tree sap on it, which normally you can't remove from anything, or fingerprints, I actually have uh, one or two scopes on here that um, uh, somebody touched the lens at one point and it never really came out. Uh, with this, nothing is going to stick to that lens. It is amazing stuff. Like my binoculars, I, I treat them pretty rough. I have a pair of engaged binoculars I've talked about. And uh, yeah, I, I treat them like field binoculars. I you know knock them into stuff, do all kinds of things, and I cannot seem to damage those binoculars. They are still doing perfectly. They are exactly like how they came out of the box. Yeah, they might be dirty, but as far as performance, they continue to uh, work. So we're getting better and better coatings all the time, and actually we're starting to get them on lower and lower end scopes, some with uh, much lower price tags. Another thing to be looking for as you start to get up in price tag, uh, yes, I have noticed that tracking for the most part does start to get better with your turrets. For the most part, I don't think I've ever run into a scope where the reticle didn't track right, where it wasn't quite the right size to be able to measure uh, its distances. Uh, like one milliradian has always been one milliradian. Uh, as far as I can tell, that's always worked for me. But turret tracking might be off just a little bit. And some of these, as we get up in price, really uh, nail that down. And not just how precise they are, but how nice the click is. Uh, for example, the Falcon that we have here, the M18, these track perfectly. I have tested this in the box test. I've also had my uh, garbage bin of truth test. Uh, this does track very well, but it doesn't have quite the same feel 
Oh, I forgot that I cleaned this one up. This one actually does feel pretty darn good now. But yeah, some of these will feel just a little bit on the mushy side when popping from one spot to the next, or it might not have the best uh, audio to it. You might not be able to really hear the click. If we're out in the field and we want to be able to very precisely dial to one spot to make sure that we get that precise hit, then I do want these uh, turrets to have a really good feel and sound to them. If I'm wearing some, oh, that's so nice. If I have some hearing protection, uh, that is going to drown out a whole lot of sounds. I'd still like to be able to hear that click just a little bit. Oh man, that's good. Uh, some of the others like this one, the, the TS-20X, let's take a feel of this. This one is a bit more on that mushy side. This one doesn't have a really positive pop from one spot to the next, but I can hear it. And it does seem to lock into a pretty good spot. But when you're actually moving it, it doesn't feel like you're hitting a wall and then snapping to the next spot. This one feels like it kind of floats from one to the next. And I can get just a little bit of uh, kind of a palpation in there. Uh, this is one where if I were wearing gloves, I probably wouldn't be able to feel a single click or four little clicks to the next uh, correct spot. I would want to be looking at it to make sure that it clicks over. Not a big deal, but again, as you start to get into uh, some of these more expensive scopes, you might get a little bit uh, better feel there. Magnification and zoom ratio. The higher you want both of those, if you want to be able to see your target really up close and to be able to see it very precisely, you're going to be paying for that in general. So if you have a scope that's a 3 to 9 versus a 4 to 16, you can usually expect to pay more for that 4 to 16 and not just because the zoom ratio is higher. Although if we do start to get into a higher zoom ratio, uh, like we talked about before, uh, this typical whitetail scope, a 3 to 9, has a 3x zoom ratio. That's 9 divided by 3. So that's going to have a pretty limited range of zoom. We're not going to be able to back out a whole lot. We're not going to be able to zoom in a whole lot. And it's going to be relatively inexpensive versus something like the US Optics TS-8X, which can zoom all the way out to 1x and all the way into 8x. This is a magnificently flexible scope. This is one that you can use to take precise shots at 600 yards and beyond. And this is one that you can take a very quick, hasty shot at a, uh, a hog that's charging you <laughs> as, uh, as Billy tested out. He, he wasn't using this scope. He was using, I think, a red dot. But uh, yeah, we've actually done some pretty close range work with uh, scopes like this. And uh, that is worth paying for. If you can get a good scope that can zoom all the way that far in and all the way that far out, uh, you can have a scope that can do more, depending on what your situation is. Sometimes what you're paying for is also your materials. Some of these may have more expensive uh, things that go into them, like if you're using magnesium, say in a pair of binoculars, uh, if you have a magnesium chassis on the inside, you're gonna be paying for that versus say aluminum or plastic. And some of these are also going to have some of those uh, rarer materials on the inside. For the most part, we're gonna have aluminum and uh, there's of course the glass quality, uh, but we're not gonna be running into too much else. And then there's also the warranty. Take a look at the warranty that's listed on the manufacturer's website. Some of these are lifetime, and that lifetime might be uh, not quite what you're thinking. You need to take a look at the fine print. Uh, certain of these, like, okay, if any scope comes out of England, for example, they actually have a limitation on what they can put on their warranty. I think they can only warranty this for two years. It's a good scope, thankfully, and if you find any problems with it, you can get it replaced within that two-year window, but I think by law, they're actually not allowed to extend a warranty past that point. Uh, with some of these others, though, you may have a, a full lifetime no matter what happens to it. I think that's kind of how Vortex works. Uh, you guys can tell me in the comments below how Vortex has been for you guys, because I know that people talk about warranty a lot. If they get a scope that fails, they can send it back. And for some uh, folks that I've seen, that can be you know either a good thing or a bad thing. Uh, we'll see that down below. But yeah, check out what's going on. Like the Bushnell uh, Ironclad warranty, that one does have uh, a limit to it compared to some of the others out there. And you might see if it works for you. Bushnell makes stuff that's so good now that uh, I kind of don't care. Now we get into perceived benefits. And I think that's where we get some of these answers on the forums. 
uh, people, if they see a, a high price tag on something, like for example, there is this adage out there that whatever scope you get needs to be at least as much as your rifle. It needs to cost as least as much, at least as much as a rifle, or it needs to cost double what the rifle does. That's another one that I've seen. Uh, I've seen all kinds of formulas for the perfect scope, and I'm here to tell you right now, based on my testing with all of these, no, that's not how it works at all. Uh, that is a perceived thing. If you throw more money at it, it's not necessarily going to get better. Some of these that have a budget that's very, very close to the cost of the rifle or even less, they're going to be fantastic. They're going to work really well, like the, uh, the Falcon here. This guy works great, or the SWFA. Uh, both of those are really good scopes for a lot of people's uses, and as long as that fits your purpose, they're going to be really good. There's also this perception of reliability, that if you pay more, you've got something that is going to be uh, more hardcore in the field. And in some cases, that is correct. you got your Night Force scopes uh, that they've kind of built their reputation on being really tough in the field. And, you know, they have those advertisements, you know, where, where some uh, marksman is talking about how out in Afghanistan, he got shot through the scope and he kept on fighting because it kept working. Uh, they have put some real work into making a scope that's very tough and one that works for military folks. Same with US Optics, Schmidt and Bender. These guys have built a solid reputation around uh, the reliability of their scopes and how well they continue tracking and how they keep in the fight. And yeah, you're gonna be paying for that sort of thing. Um, but some of these might not actually fall down much compared to those even at a lower price tag. They just might not have that reputation to back it up. As you look through the catalogs of big scope companies, you'll see different lines of scopes. Some of these will have similar features and functions. Why the price differences? Look for where the scope was manufactured. Japan, Germany, and Austria have earned reputations for making high quality precision instruments. The less expensive scopes in the catalog might be made elsewhere. I've tested some very good scopes from the Philippines, and another one to keep an eye on, especially right now, is South Korea. There are some real hidden gems that come in at a very good price point, like the Bushnell Prime 3-9x40 that I tested. The more expensive scopes in the catalog might also be hand-fitted for tighter tolerances. The real bottom line of this whole discussion is that money does not necessarily equal better downrange performance. Actually, in a lot of cases, it's not even down to what scope you have and maybe some of its wonderful qualities. For the most part, it's actually up to you and your willingness to get out and actually test what you have and get used to taking those shots. For example, if you have some of these scopes that have really cool reticles that can make precise hits and you've never actually tested it out in the field to see how it works, it doesn't really matter that you have something that can do it. Uh, you need to get used to it and you need to start building that experience. But then even within the scopes that we have here, don't necessarily assume that price tag is going to fix everything. Some of these that have that low price tag, like I talked about, they may have everything that you're looking for, and they may really start to punch upward at companies that have a higher price tag and maybe have that, uh, that notion of durability. They have that reputation out there, but some of these can actually do the same thing as everybody else. SWFA here, they have built their reputation on an inexpensive, reliable scope for a long time. This scope has been around for a very long time and people, it's kind of that hidden gem in the industry. Uh, people just know that, people in the know uh, that have done a lot of long range shooting and precision shooting, they know that this is going to perform even at its low price tag. And that applies to some of the others that we have through here. They're gonna start really punching upward at some of these bigger companies, including the Europeans, and uh, they will come away very favorably. Listen to your independent reviewers. I'm gonna put links to some of them down below here, and you can hear what people actually say testing these out in the field. That's one of the things that really uh, works for me. If I have a guy like Kurt Vaughn, Joe, uh, Cyclops Joe Ray, or uh, West Desert Shooter, or Coda Boy 32, I listen to their opinion more than I will somebody that's being paid to uh, check out some of these scopes. Thanks a lot for watching everybody. Make sure that you like, share, subscribe, hit the notification bell so you don't miss the next videos in this series. We're gonna have uh, some stuff where we really start to put all this together and how you can find the best uh, rifle scope at your local shop. We have a few more topics that we need to get through before that point. Many thanks to patrons of the Destructive Arts. They're the ones that have bought the audio gear. I have a couple microphones on me here. I've got uh, some pretty good lights going, cameras, and uh, some of the other ancillary things that we use to test scopes and rifles and all that good stuff. If you want to join their ranks, I'll put a link to Patreon around here. 
And I'd like to especially call out our 338 Lapua Magnum members. We have uh, Sportsman's Guide, Stan and Mary, and Tyler. And at the 300 Win Mag level, we have Joseph Davis, Peter, Mr. No Name, and Howard. Thanks a lot, you guys. And thanks to everybody else that's chipping in a buck or two a month. I really do appreciate you guys. And I think so do everybody else that's watching these videos. See you guys in the next one. Thanks for watching. If you like this video, be sure to like, share, and most importantly, subscribe. Even if you didn't like this particular content, go ahead and subscribe. There's probably something coming that's more up your alley. Check out this playlist right here. This is going to have videos in a similar vein to what you just watched. These two videos we cherry picked for you. And finally, The Social Regressive is on Patreon. So you can become a patron of the destructive arts and earn some goodies while helping us to provide high quality videos just by kicking us a few bucks a month. Thanks a bunch for your patronage.